Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we are about to start the session on the new approaches to HIV. Uh, welcome to this track. Before we start, um, there are a few announcements uh, I would like to make before I make the announcements. My name is Yolanda Simon. I am the co-chair with my colleague, Carlos Adon. And before we get the panel going, because we're quite excited, we have a wealth of knowledge in here, and we know time is against us, but hopefully we will be able to not only get through all the presentations, but we would have a rich discussion as well from you all. Okay, so uh, for the announcements, this session will be translated simultaneously in English and Spanish. Please plug your, head, your, your earbuds into the receivers located on your chairs, and I want to interject. Do remember, if you are moving the equipment off of the chair, to please leave it on the chair at the end of the session. People have started walking out with the equipment, which is of no use to you if you take them home. If you are applying, okay, if you need them, if you need them, additional earbuds will be located at the entrance door. Complete your session evaluation forms. I think most of you would have seen them at the back of the table or there may be a volunteer who's here at the back of the room, there she is, who will give them to you. Please remember to complete them and hand them in at the back of the room before you leave on the conclusion of the session. If you are applying for continuing education credits, return your evaluation forms to the information desk located in the registration area where they will scan the barcode on your name tag so that you can get your credits. Very important to remember. When we are doing the Q&A, uh, you need to come to the microphones which are in the aisles you need to speak directly into the microphones. You need to state your name and the country that you're from. Photography, videography, and audio taping of audience members during this session is strictly prohibited. Thank you for your adherence to the conference principles and codes of conduct. So let's get right in and let me hand over to my colleague, Dr. Adon. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to present uh, Dr. Serena Koenig. Dr. Koenig is an infectious disease physician and an assistant professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where she serves on the faculties of Division of Global Health Equity and on the Division of Infectious Disease. She has been working in Haiti for the past decade and initially as the attending physician in the first eight and, eight and tuberculosis treatment uh, in the rural Haiti with Partners and Health. Six years ago, she began a close collaboration with Gaithco and where she works with the, her Haitian colleagues to conduct implementation research studies with the go uh, goal of improving HIV and TB related care. She and her colleagues recently conducted a cost effectiveness analysis of early versus defer ART, demonstrating that the new WHO guidelines for early ART are cost effective in Haiti and likely in other resource poor settings as well. They also evaluated the clinical impact and cost of routine laboratory testing for ART related toxicity, finding that, if, that few of these tests are cost effective or impact clinical care. Most recently, she and her colleagues are evaluating several strategies to improve retention in care during the third art period. She has also uh, conducted two studies with uh, her TTRD colleagues, one on the long-term outcomes of HIV treatment in the Caribbean and one on the cost of HIV treatment. Welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna keep my eye on the clock because this presentation is gonna be, uh, there's a lot we could say and I'm going to need to focus on just the most important elements. 
So what I'm presenting today are the outcomes from the Trans-Caribbean HIV AIDS uh, research, research Initiative Long-Term Outcomes Study. Uh, CHARI, as it's called, was launched in 2006, and it's a collaboration between several of the largest AIDS clinical and research centers in the Caribbean and the NIH Office of AIDS Research. There were seven sites that participated in this study. Um, you can see them here. It was Barbados, Haiti, Jamaica, Martinique, Trinidad, and uh, Puerto Rico. I want to start by saying I'm the one who's presenting this data, but this was a there were many, many people that were involved in this study, in particular Dr. Pop, Bill Pop, who's here. Uh, it was his idea to do this study, and he's the one who obtained the funding. Uh, we have investigators from Barbados, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Martinique, Trinidad, and Puerto Rico. In addition, we had statisticians from Cornell University. Our methods, we were very interested in looking at long-term outcomes of ART-naive patients on antiretroviral therapy. You, there's been several studies published from Africa, but nothing had yet been published uh, across the Caribbean. We chose patients that were uh, older than 13 years of age, and they had to be consecutively enrolled on ART at each site. The study dates varied between sites, but all patients were enrolled between 1998 and 2008. Our primary outcomes were all-cause mortality and retention in care over the duration of the study. Uh, we measured time from the date of ART initiation to the date of death, loss to follow-up, or closing date of the study. We had 8,203 patients. 58% uh, of them were from Haiti, 15% from the DR, 9% from Trinidad, 7% from Barbados, 6% from Jamaica, 4% from Martinique, and 2% from Puerto Rico. 51% of our cohort was female, and the median age at ART initiation was 38 years. 42% had attended no school or primary school only, and 57% lived on less than $1 per day. We measured income in Barbados, Haiti, Trinidad, and Puerto Rico. The median baseline weight was 111, uh, it ranged actually. Haiti had the lowest uh, body weight, with a median of 111 for women and 125 for men, and Martinique and Puerto Rico had patients that were heavier at the time that they initiated ART. Baseline hemoglobin, again, it was Haiti that was on the bottom along with Trinidad, and then Puerto Rico was at the top. So ranging from uh, 10 and 11 for women and men in Haiti, and 11.8 and 13.2 in um, Puerto Rico. IV drug use was common only in the Puerto Rican cohort, and I also just want to make it, it very clear, those 193 patients from Puerto Rico were very difficult to treat. They had very high rates of IV drug use, and they had extremely high rates of hepatitis C, and they had patients that were very migratory. Nearly all of the tuberculosis was in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, also I, I think a very interesting point, and quite worrisome, most patients had very low CD4 cell counts at ART initiation. 76% had a CD4 cell count that was less than 200. 83% in Trinidad, 81% in the Dominican Republic, 78% in Haiti. You can see, you know, 70 in Jamaica, 67 in Barbados. Martinique and Puerto Rico were, were better, they had higher CD4 cell counts than the other countries. In the entire cohort, the median CD4 cell count was 118, which considering the CIPRA study showing higher mortality, if you uh, wait until your CD4 count drops below 200, I think clearly we have a lot of work to do in this area. Treatment regimens, 90% of patients had an NNRTI in the first line regimen. And of these, 59% received efavirenz and 41% nevirapine. Interestingly, Martinique and Puerto Rico were different from the other countries. They m were more likely to use uh, a protease inhibitor. 
another point, the Puerto Rican cohort was a little old, was um, a little earlier than the Martinique cohort, and they mostly had patients on nelfinavir and indinavir, whereas the uh, Martinique was more likely to use uh, calitra or atazanavir. The median follow-up time across our cohort was 31 months, ranging from 20 months in the Dominican Republic to 52 months in Barbados. So of our 8,203 patients, 1,048, or 13%, were known to have died during this study. Uh, the study. The death rates were quite uh, across quite a range, from 6% in Martinique, 8% in Jamaica, 11% in Trinidad, 13% in Haiti, 15% in the DR and Barbados, and 24% in Puerto Rico. Again, the Puerto Rican cohort had a lot of hep C and IV drug use. Mortality was highest in the first three months, as has been shown in other studies, such as that art link paper. So similar to Africa, we definitely had highest mortality in the first three months. And it was most particularly high in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad. But remember, Trinidad had a median CD4 cell count of only 85 at ART initiation, and most of the tuberculosis is in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. These are going to be <laughs> not so easy to see, but these are the Kaplan-Meier curves. So you can see there's Puerto Rico down at the bottom. This is survival, and this is retention and care. So we defined retention and care as alive and had a visit within the final six months of the study. And uh, mortality was definitely known to be dead. So Puerto Rico clearly had uh, the worst outcomes, but again, they had a very difficult cohort to treat. Uh, at the top, you had Martinique and Trinidad for both of these, and then in the middle, you had um, Barbados, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. So we uh, looked at predictors of mortality, and in the univariate analysis, it was older age, male gender, tuberculosis, IV drug use, lower baseline body weight, hemoglobin, and CD4 cell count. In the multivariable analysis, the, um, these variables are associated with a lower hazard ratio of death, having a higher body weight, having a higher hemoglobin, having a higher CD4 cell count at ART initiation. And that's a surprise to nobody. That's what all the studies from Africa show as well. Uh, higher hazard ratio of death would male gender, tuberculosis, and increased age. Male gender is particularly interesting because all studies have not shown that males have a higher risk, and we've controlled for the other variables that we were able to identify. The Cassinets, the South America and Latin America cohort, did not find that, um, that male gender was, was associated with the higher hazard ratio, so that's interesting. And IV drug use was not associated with mortality when we controlled for other variables, but the numbers were quite small because, again, Puerto Rico had almost all of the IV drug users, and they only had 193 patients in that cohort. Haiti, Dominican Republic, other countries have a very low rate of IV drug use. Now, interesting, we, we included the treatment site into the multivariable model. Uh, when in terms of identifying predictors of mortality. So if you just looked at the univariates, Martinique and Haiti is the reference. So Martinique was 0.43, Jamaica 0.58, Trinidad 0.68, and all of those are statistically significant. Then you had DR and Puerto Rico a little higher. Uh, Barbados was not statistically significantly different from Haiti. But in the multivariable analysis, if you included the fact that in particular the Haitian patients had a lot of tuberculosis, low body weight, low hemoglobin, there was no difference in mortality between Haiti, Jamaica, Martinique, and Trinidad. The differences did persist for Barbados, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. Uh, however, we, we didn't have a perfect model. So we didn't include hepatitis C in our model. We did not include um, migration status. So I, I think it's just important in noting these differences that it's very dangerous to compare mortality between sites because the patients are so different, it's really very hard to compare them and have it reflect quality of the program. 
Long-term retention in care, 75% of patients were alive and in care at the end of the study. And the relative positions of the countries, if you compared the Kaplan-Meier for survival and retention, were, were similar. Everyone kept the same order except for Jamaica. Jamaica had the second lowest mortality rate at 8%, but the second highest loss to follow-up rate at 16%. So you know, potentially some of the patients that were lost to follow-up had actually died. Long-term retention in care, again, Martinique at the top with 89%, 82% in Trinidad, 78% Barbados, 76% in Jamaica, 75% Haiti, 72% Dominican Republic, and 29% in Puerto Rico. Uh, once again, the rate of loss to follow-up was highest in the first six months. That could be for two reasons. First, it could be that some of those patients had actually died that you called loss to follow up. And in addition, those patients that are going to be very non-adherent may drop out very early on, where those that are more committed are going to stay in care for at least six months. So I have, uh, boy, I've done well. I have eight minutes left and only my summary points. Uh, the, this is the first multi-cohort study on long-term ART outcomes in the Caribbean. These outcomes are excellent, and the mortality rates compare to other low- and middle-income countries. Most of the mortality difference between sites can be explained by the severity of disease, tuberculosis, gender, and nutritional status. And, you know, in future models, we would like to also consider um, whether patients are migratory and hepatitis C. There is increasing pressure to compare mortality across sites. Our findings would suggest that that is very dangerous if you're in any way relating it to a measure of quality of care that's being delivered. Uh, among our cohort in the Caribbean, uh, in terms of the characteristics, their gender, weight, and hemoglobin were more similar to African cohorts than to North American cohorts. The median uh, baseline CD4 cell count of 118 is similar to the ARTLINK cohort, the cohort that was done all across most of the African countries, which had a median CD4 cell count of 108. And it was lower from, than the cohorts from North America and Europe, which had a median CD4 cell count of 234 at ART initiation. Martinique and Puerto Rico are the exceptions. They had a higher CD4 at ART initiation, and they were more likely to receive a protease inhibitor. They were also more likely to be monitored with viral load. We had high early mortality in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad. In contrast, Martinique and Puerto Rico had early mortality that was similar to that of industrialized countries. The predictors of mortality were similar to other studies from low and middle income countries, particularly most African cohorts. Older age, TB, lower weight, hemoglobin, and CD4. The male gender, it depends on the country. There's definitely literature from Africa suggesting that male gender is associated with poor outcomes. 76% of patients start ART with a CD4 count less than 200, and the baseline CD4 cell count has not substantially improved in subsequent cohorts. We're giving a talk this afternoon where we'll present this in a little bit more detail. Now granted, this most countries at the time of the enrollment in this study were using the old WHO guidelines. Um, so perhaps this has improved slightly as people shift to earlier treatment. Improved nutritional supplementation will be critical to lowering mortality rates in undernourished patients, particularly in countries like Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, and TB is a major problem on the island of Hispaniola. We will need to do further research to look at the impact of the new WHO guidelines, particularly now that it suggests using ART for all TB patients, and we'll have to look at how that will impact TB mortality. Also, if we can begin to use um, better diagnostic tests, such as GeneXpert, that would allow us to uh, make an earlier diagnosis for patients with TB. We have uh, data from Haiti suggesting that if we start antiretroviral therapy and a patient is subsequently diagnosed with tuberculosis in the next three months, the mortality is much, much higher because they likely had TB at the time we started ART and then they had unmasking 
and immune reconstitution. So that uh, potentially also contributes to the mortality, early mortality in Haiti and the DR. Uh, it's the male gender, I think, requires further research. Male gender is associated with mortality in China, Cambodia, and some countries in Africa, but had not been reported in Latin America. In my last slide, retention rates are similar to middle-income countries of sub-Saharan Africa and higher than most low-income countries. There was a meta-analysis of 32 studies from um, sub-Saharan Africa that found 60% retention at 24 months, and then a follow-up had 70%. Uh, in the Caribbean, or across the Caribbean, it's 75%. We attribute our excellent retention in Chari to the fact that we included well-established sites, that ART and HIV care are free of charge. All sites track patients that miss visits, and most programs subsidize transportation fees. Thank you. Okay, uh, please, if you have questions here or comments, they're welcome. Colleen campbell Wellington, on Jamaica. Culturally, our men tend not to go to the doctors early. Do you think that there is any significance in terms of our male patients seeking treatment early and their mortality rate? Well, we did control for CD4 cell count at ART initiation and weight and hemoglobin. So it should be more than just the fact that men were sicker when they presented. Perhaps it has to do with occupational factors. Uh, I think we, we need to look further at this issue. A very excellent presentation. I have one question. I'm Mauricio Mayor from Puerto Rico. Uh, when you evaluate mortality in Puerto Rico, do you, do you make some difference between the mortality who is related with, with HIV and mortality who is related with uh, uh, overdoses, accidents, and all the things so that we can see a really a uh, relation with the infection and the outcome? Uh, we measured all-cause mortality. We were not able to look at the cause of death in the cohort. Ellen Koenig, Santo Domingo. Um, the sexual orientation of the group, did you have that broken down? Uh, how many MSM and how many heterosexuals? Uh, we did not break down the, uh, based on the risk factor of getting infection. Though most countries, like for example in Haiti, it's heterosexual. Dominican Republic, it's heterosexual. So most of the countries would have said that uh, other than the small number of IV drug users, there's probably a small number of um, men who have sex with men, but we don't have numbers on that. Okay, if there are no more questions, we're going to move on to our second speaker. Um, and this is, <laughs> he's excited already. But I want to introduce Dr. Pablo Tibas. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Puerto Rico. He is originally from Spain, where he did internal medicine <laughs> at the Madrid University, and then infectious disease at Washington University in St. Louis. He has been treating patients with HIV for more than 20 years, and his research interests are in the metabolic complications of HIV infections. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tibas. Thank you very much. You're here for a quite a change on topic. Uh, I am working University of Pennsylvania now, and although I love Puerto Rico and I know very well Jorge Santana who invited me to give this talk. I'm gonna talk about HIV and, and bone complications and, and metabolics, which is quite a change. And I will try to make some references to the Caribbean, although there is not much data o about what's happening in, the, in this region with bone metabolics in HIV-infected individuals. So I'm gonna go quickly of the things that we know about HIV and bones. And the first thing that we know about HIV and bones is that both osteopenia and osteoporosis is very common in patients with HIV infection. 
This is a study that was done by Todd Brown uh, from Hopkins showing different cohorts. It's uh, one of these uh, summaries of multiple studies. And as you can see, anything to the right of that vertical line means that the frequency of osteoporosis is higher in HIV-infected patients than in HIV non-infected patients. This is another study that had proper controls for the general population. In the U.S., we have a a NHANES cohort that basically samples the whole population of the U.S. And what uh, Turner Overton did was compare the bone mineral density in patients with HIV to the general population, controlling for traditional risk factors for low bone mineral density for osteopenia and osteoporosis. And what he saw was that patients with HIV in general, in blue on that curve, have a low, lower bone mineral density than HIV uninfected individuals, and that the traditional risk factors for bone in the general population, like having low body weight, older age, were also present in patients with HIV, but there were also factors related to HIV infection, like low CD4 cell count and the length of infection of HIV. When you see this data, you have to ask yourself why. Why the patients with HIV have lower bone mineral density than the general population? And the classic question of what is the chicken and what is the egg? Is this related to being HIV positive or is this related to what we do for the treatment of HIV infection? So this is a study that I'm going to talk a couple of uh, times in, uh, in the presentation that we did in the AIDS clinical trial group, which is a large organization in the U.S. and international also. It has a unit in, in, in Haiti uh, that look at metabolic complications with some of the newer regimens that we use to treat HIV infection that they, they will also be familiar to you. In this study, people that were naive to therapy that had never been treated with HIV medicines were randomized to receive or tenofovir or avacavir 3TC with efavirans or atazanavir ritonavir. This type of design is what we call factorial design. So if there is no interactions between the different arms, you can put together arms. So you can uh, put together the both tenofovir arms and compare the tenofovir arms to the avacavir arms, like in this analysis or you can put together the two efavirans arms and compare them to the atazanavir ritonavir arms. This is a way to decrease the sample size of these massive studies that are very expensive and is a statistical way to deal with the, the, that issue. So in this study that was presented for GRACE and we did in the ACTG, they look at the bone mineral density of patients with HIV before they ever saw antiretroviral therapy. So you, in this study, you can ask the question, how much of this low bone mineral density is related to the fact of being HIV positive? And as you can see, 35% of the participants had a bone mineral density, a T-score. That's the way we check for what is normal bone mineral density in, in, in the general population, but also in the HIV population, 35% of the patients before starting antiretroviral therapy have low bone mineral density. That's more than expected. The T-score is like a CETA score, and if you remember your statistics in, in, in school, uh, the expected proportion of people with a low bone mineral density would be around 16%. So yes, by being HIV positive, you have a risk of higher, have higher uh, frequency of low bone mineral density. What happens when you start antiretroviral therapy? And this is the second thing, the third thing that we know about uh, uh, HIV infection and bone loss, is when you start antiretroviral therapy, you lose bone. We don't understand very well why yet, and this is an area of uh, interest for many groups trying to figure out why when you do something as good as giving antiretroviral therapy, suddenly you lose a uh, bone. And as you can see in, the, in, in this side of the, of the graphic, you lose around 2% to 4% of bone, depending if you are starting a vaca over 3TC or tenof over 3TC, you lose between 2 or 4% of your bone mass. And also, if you start a fabulous or natasanavir, you lose again, around 3 to 4% of your bone mass. So you lose a little bit more if you start with some drugs, like tenofovir, than if you start with avacavir, 
or if you start with a protease inhibitor that if you start with a Faberance-based regimen. How relevant is this is the next question. So sure, you see this bone loss when you start antiretroviral therapy, losing three or four percent of your bone mass, how clinically important is that? It's a similar amount what you, women lose after menopause, to just to put it in perspective. Okay, for the four or five years after menopause, this is the same amount of bone that you lose when you start antiretroviral therapy. We didn't know about how clinically relevant this was until relatively recently. This is a paper that was published a couple of years ago that shows that this problem is clinically relevant. And in this study, it's a study of two, around two million people in, in Massachusetts. They look at the frequency of fractures in HIV positive patients compared to patients that didn't have HIV infection. And as you can see here in the arrows, those are the frequency in HIV positive patients. And as you can see, the frequency of fracture is higher in HIV infected individuals, both males and females. This is not a gender issue. Both, patient, both groups at all ages have higher fractures than the general population. What has happened since we started antiretroviral therapy? What has happened since we started antiretroviral therapy, the era of heart started around 1996. The number of fracture has increases per 100 patients years of follow-up. This is a study that we did uh, with Roger Bedimo, we presented in, in the Rome meeting this su last summer, that look in the BA cohort where they have around, uh, I mean, literally, uh, thousands of patients with HIV, more than 50,000 patients with HIV followed uh, for a, a long period of time. And as you can see, the number of fractures before the heart era was around one per 100, per 1,000 patients years follow up. In the heart era is around four fractures per 1,000 patients year follow up. Why this is happening? It can be a combination of two things. Patients are living longer because before the heart era, they didn't age enough, and there has been other talks about aging with HIV. So they didn't have time to age, so they didn't have time to, to fracture their bones. And the second reason why this might be happening is that the antiretroviral therapy by itself decreases the bone mineral density in patients with HIV. We look at the effects in this study of different antiretroviral therapy, and you remember the slide that I put before, that you, lose, you tend to lose more bone if you start at an off ovary based regimen or a boosted pre-based regimen. And this study looked at the frequency of fractures, and there was a slightly increase in the frequency of, fracture, uh, of fractures in individuals that started with a ten off ovary based regimen, that is the one that is associated with more bone loss initially, or a PI-based regimen. And this is after controlling for traditional risk factors for fractures like chronic kidney disease, age, race, tobacco, diabetes, and, bone, uh, and body mass index. So some medicines make you lose more bones in the long run. Those medicines might be associated with a slight increase, not a dramatic increase, but with a slight increase risk of fracture. What do we do about it? What can we do about it? And this is the approach to bone problems in HIV patients. So this is what this is a, a study, a paper that we published a, a, a year ago or so, looking at general recommendations for patients with HIV. And the top is what we call initial approach. This is good for everybody, and this is in the everybody everywhere in, in the world. You look for risk factors, and if you know your internal medicine, age, gender your low body weight and a history of fracture is a risk factor for osteoporosis, and then you give lifestyle advice to the patients. And this is good for everybody, including everybody sitting in this room. Smoking cessation, uh, take enough vitamin D and calcium. Many countries don't supplement the milk uh, with vitamin D, so many patients have a vitamin D deficiency, and the calcium intake in many places is not enough. And then exercise and sun exposure are good advice for your bone health. And then in some patients, you need to do a DEXA, which I think probably the access to DEXA in the Caribbean region is limited, but nowadays there are machines, special machines that are portable, ultrasounds, that you can almost do uh, bone mineral densities in, in, in your bones without having access to this, one of these special machines. 
And we recommend doing a DEXA in any patient with HIV that is older than 50. So it's relatively simple to remember that. And then when you do uh, DEXA, the next question is what do you do about it? This is a recommendation of DEXAs in the general population in the US and in Europe. The recommendation is to do DEXAs in women that are older than 65 and men that are older than 70 years of age. The reason for that is that this is the group that have a, high, are high, have a higher risk of fractures of the hip or the, and, and the spine. And, but they recommend doing DEXAs, looking at bominal density and younger patients, if they have a condition that predispose them to osteopenia osteoporosis. HIV is not listed on, on that list of conditions that predispose osteopenia osteoporosis, but I showed you that before that HIV patients are at a higher risk of this. So I would include HIV here, and that's why we recommend doing assessments of the abdominal density in people that are older uh, than 50. When you ask the people that wrote these guidelines, they tell you they just forgot about HIV patients, which, as you know, happens relatively frequently. So what do you do next? When you do a DEXA, you have three possibilities. The patient can be osteoporotic, which is, has a T-score less than minus 2.5. They can be normal with a T-score greater than minus one, and they can be somewhere in between. If you have osteoporosis, you need to treat. You need to prevent the development of fractures. This is very few people. People ask me how many people I treat with osteoporosis. Very few with HIV infection, because I think prevention works most of the time. If you have a normal bone mineral density, what we tell the patients is to continue to do the things that are healthy, exercise, vitamin D, and not smoking. If you are in between these two categories, you go to, a, we call a, the FRAX score. You have to calculate the FRAX score. This is the indications for treatment. If you have osteoporosis, you should treat. If you are in between, you, do, you have to calculate the FRAX score, which is like the Framingham score that we use in the US to calculate the cardiovascular risk. And then if your risk of fracture is greater than 20% or greater than 3% at 10 years, then that's an indication of treatment. How do you calculate a FRAX score? You go to this website that, that was done by this guy, and then you, the, this, the website asks you general questions about the patient, and then you, put, you introduce all those, you answer all those questions, you select a country. I was trying to select a country from the Caribbean, but there is no data from the Caribbean. There is data from the US and data from Mexico, but not from the Caribbean, and because I am from Spain, I pick a Spanish patient. So you answer these questions, and at the end, it tells you what the risk is of a fracture after 10 years. And depending on those numbers, the decision to start or not to start, uh, you, you base the decision to start or not to start uh, treatment for the osteoporosis. What treatment is the best treatment for uh, osteoporosis in patients with HIV? Almost all the data that we have nowadays is based on bisphosphonates, like alendronate, and because the osteopenia osteoporosis that we see in patients with HIV is what we call a high bone turnover, and alendronate quiets down the bone, this is the best treatment, the one that we have enough data to support in patients with HIV. However, the idea that treatment for osteopenia osteoporosis is easy and is not without complication is gone. Last month, the FDA made this announcement that drugs that are used for the treatment of osteopenia osteoporosis, including alendronate and including uh, other bisphosphonates, are associated with some complications like necrosis of the jaw and long-term complications and that you have to use them with caution and for a limited period of time. So you really have to select the patients that you are going to do this type of uh, interventions. And of course, we live in the US, and as soon as there is one of these uh, advisories from the FDA, you get the lawyers asking uh, to uh, do a lawsuit against the physicians. So the general message, that I, the summary that I want to send to you is that uh, you have to address bone health in patients with HIV. Make sure that everybody has an adequate intake of vitamin D and calcium and it does enough exercise and do not smoke. And this is the summary of my presentation. Both HIV and its treatment is associated with bone loss, 
Some drugs are more associated with bone loss than others. HIV patients have a higher risk of fractures than the general population. This is not a reason not to treat HIV. The risk of fractures is something that is preventable. It happens to 15, 20 years from now when you start antiretroviral treatment. These com metabolic complications are not a reason to deny life-saving therapy to any patients with HIV. It's something that we need to deal with, but not to deny therapy because of this. Prevention is the best strategy to address this problem. In a few patients, in the few patients that need treatment for the bone disease, alendronate is the choice that has most data. And that was all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Do you see an improvement of the uh, osteopenia if you change treatment? There is not much data about that, but there has been a switch studies, like the steel study, patients that were stable on a regimen that uh, was a nucleus with ACT3TC and, and uh, PIs. They were randomized to receive a tenofovir-based regimen or a avacavir-based regimen. When patients started avacavir, they had improvements in the bone mineral density. Patients that switched to tenofovir, they had worsening of the bone mineral density. But if you look at cardiovascular risk, is the, is the, is a flip. So yes, there is an improvement, but I don't think bone health is a good reason to start switching patients unless somebody has a very, very high risk for fractures, and then in that patient, I would not pick tenofovir. But if somebody is doing well, I think it's easier to deal with these issues, yes, by modifying the lifestyle than doing switches in therapy. Next question. Yes, I'm not sure if I missed it, but just can you just, um, just say that about what the mean time after initiation heart does a patient um, experience significant bone loss on? on, on it the happens heart? immediately after starting heart. Is, is over the first six months. And last year, there was very nice data presented in CROI that suggests that there's some sort of immune reconstitution. Is you have this incre massive increase in CD4 cells. The CD4 T cells are the ones that produce some of the, rank some of the cytokines that drive bone uh, uh, metabolism. And it's probably an immune reconstitution phenomenon. What happens in the bone, but it's still not well characterized. It's at the beginning. After that, everybody stays stable. Hi, Chad Desai, Chicago. Uh, do we have an understanding of uh, HIV and its effect on the clotho gene, which is associated with accelerated mutation of which is associated with accelerated um, osteoporosis and atherosclerosis? What, what gene, sorry? Clotho, K-L-O-T-H-O. I'm gonna have to say that I, I don't know if there is any data of interactions with HIV with that particular gene, but it would be nice to hear more. Okay. I don't know. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Joan Jonas, USA. Um, I was wondering in terms of when you were looking at your baseline level of HIV positive people who had lower bone density and um, lower bone marrow density as well, was there any correlation to number of CD4 counts or disease progression? And does that mean that it could just, you know, Treatment of that could also enhance treatment of, uh, of regular HRT me uh, medication. Sorry, medication. This was looked by Turner and Overton in that study that compared HIV patients with the enhanced population and some factors related to HIV, like low CD4 count and being infected with HIV for a long time, was associated with most more osteoporosis than than not. It's a, it's a risk factor for low bone mineral density in patients with HIV. When you start treatment, at the beginning you lose a little bit of bone and then it gets stable. So therapy hurts the, uh, the bone a little bit, but not serious enough not to consider therapy. This is, this is the only metabolic complication that really when you start therapy, it is a clear worsening of, of, of the situation. And when you stop therapy, the bones get, get better. There has been other studies. I didn't have time to talk about that. Okay, okay this is the last question we're taking because we need yeah. to move on with the panel. Good morning, Leonardo Feli, Santo Domingo. Have you done this study in children? Very good question. There are groups looking at what is the effect of antiretroviral therapy in bone in children because they are growing and where, wherever they are going to get is what 
they are going to have these type of problems later on in life. There are a few studies, some from Italy, uh, looking at that, and they see the si similar kind of things. Bone mineralization is affected in children. In the US, thanks to the vertical transmission uh, prophylaxis, and in Europe, uh, HIV in children, small children, ha is becoming a rarity. So those type of studies will have to be done in the developing, uh, in, in, in the developing world and really they need to be addressed because that's a big, big issue, the growth. What is the effect of treatment on the growth curves and what happens to the bone of children? Thank you very much. And now we're going to present Dr. Massimo Brito. Massimo Brito is an associate professor of medicine and the director of the Infectious Disease Fellowship Program at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also director of HIV AIDS Clinic at Jeff Brown Veteran Administration Hospital in Chicago and is in charge of the HIV Hepatitis C Co-Infection Clinic at the University of Illinois Hospital. Dr. Brito, area of, of, of clinical interest is the care of patients caught infected with HIV and hepatitis. His research work focuses on HIV prevention and male circumcision in the Dominican Republic. Dr. Brito completed a, resi a residency program and a chief residency in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital and a fellowship in infectious disease at the University of Miami School of Medicine in Florida. He holds a master in public health with a concentration in, epidemi in epidemiology from the University of Illinois School of Public Health and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Welcome. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for this most kind introduction and thank you all for being here today. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about uh, male circumcision and the evidence uh, for prevention of HIV. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ecological and observational studies on male circumcision. Tell you a word or two about the randomized clinical trials. The pathogenesis theory, why we think male circumcision works in the prevention of HIV. A word about the Dominican Republic project and our studies. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts. Male circumcision is the oldest surgical procedure in the world, known to man. I mean, the, since Egyptian writings, we know that male circumcision occurred in that civilization. It is, for some religions, um, a necessary uh, induction into the religion, like for the Muslim and Jewish faith. And in Africa, for some culture, it's a rite of passage to adulthood. Men are circumcised when they reach adolescence, and if they're not circumcised, they remain kids. So it is considered the uh, prime uh, right of passage to adulthood. This is the prevalence of male circumcision by countries and regions of the world. The regions in green are those countries that have a male circumcision prevalence of less than 20%, and Latin America is included in that. In the United States, the rate of circumcision is more than 60%, as it is in some Muslim countries and countries of Western Africa, where male circumcision is um, practice for cultural purposes. The first observations uh, of how male circumcision worked in the prevention of HIV came from ecological studies. Simple observations that countries that had very high circumcision rates, like for example Tanzania, Kenya, Cameroon, Angola, and Ghana, had a very low prevalence, have a, not a very low prevalence, but a lower prevalence of HIV than countries that are not traditionally circumcising, like Swaziland, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho. So all came, the first ideas about circumcision came from these ecological data. And then we had a myriad of observational studies done throughout the 1980s and 1990s uh, that are summarized in this slide by Helen White and published in, in AIDS in 2000, and where the observational data seems to suggest that male circumcision was protective of HIV in about 50 to 60 percent of the cases. That was validated by three recently, or not so recently, completed randomized clinical trials in 2007. The clinical trial done by Ron Gray in Rakai, Uganda, 
the uh, clinical trial done by our group in Kisumu, Kenya, by Bob Bailey, and the trials done by the French group in Orange Farm, South Africa. These trials combined found that male circumcision uh, conclusively, uh, as much as you can conclusively establish evidence in randomized clinical trials, that male circumcision is protective of HIV in about 60 to 50 percent of the cases. And that data, when you overlap it with the observational studies, is very, very, very similar, almost exact to what was observed in observational data. It's evidence-based medicine at its best in here that showing that perhaps one of the most effective strategies to prevent HIV is a simple surgical procedure. How does it work? What's the theory behind how male circumcision works? Upon erection, the inner lining of the penile mucosa is exposed. And that inner lining of the mucosa is less keratinized than the skin outside the penis. When you do male circumcision, you effectively cut this area right here, which is the inner lining of the penile mucosa, where the keratin layer is smaller and less, less suscept more susceptible to cracks in the mucosa and hence um, makes the, pen the penile mucosa more prone to infection. Male circumcision is a prime opportunity to bring men into care. It can be offered by itself. It has to be offered as part of a prevention package that includes condom distribution, um, uh, reproductive health cancers of men, evaluation for infertility, education, STI services, gender issues, substance abuse counseling, and whatnot. It is perhaps one way that we have to bring uh, our male patients to care and issues of reproductive health, which is, a, which is a problem in this area and in other areas of the world where HIV is very prevalent. So we started working in the Dominican Republic. Why the Dominican, why, why do we want to work in the Dominican Republic? Well, first, AIDS is the leading cause of death between 15 and 40, 44 years of age in the Caribbean. 230,000 patients with HIV uh, in the area, a large number of them in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. In the area that we're working, we have the prime opportunity to examine Haitians and Dominicans because of the large migrant population in that particular area. Although the HIV prevalence in the Dominican Republic across the board is not that high, the, the male circumcision prevalence and the male circumcision prevalence is low. Now, when you look at specific areas of the Dominican Republic, you know, for example, the Alta Gracia province we were, where we are working, the overall prevalence of HIV is about 1%, 1.2%, much higher than the general population. And when you look at the Bateyes, the areas where sugar cane cutters uh, habitate, it's usually about 3.2%, which is three times the national average. And the male circumcision prevalence in that particular area is very low. It's about 5%. So it is kind of the ideal setting to introduce a strategy like this. High prevalence of HIV, low circumcision rates. So with that in mind, we started, the, fir the first st step was to do an acceptability study of male circumcision in the Dominican Republic. The primary aim of, the aim of that study was to assess the acceptability of male circumcision before and after an information session about the benefits of circumcision. The secondary aims were to learn the opinions and attitudes about male circumcision learn the self-reported status of circumcision amongst the participants, and learn about the sexual practices and the history of sexually transmitted diseases. This is the map of La Alta Gracia province showing where we, in red, where we uh, administer surveys, and in blue, where we did focus group discussions. And this is what we found in the quantitative data. The median age of the cohort is about 29 years of age. The median age of first sex, which is a little lower, and the world average, which is 15, was about 14. Um, it, it is mostly um, a poorly educated population. It's about, you know, 54% of patients have not achieved eighth grade, and that number was higher in Haitians in that area because that's understandable because those are migrant workers. They're not the population. It's, it, you're, but you're bound to have differences in education. The circumcision status, there are about 95% of the men were uncircumcised. The data is almost exactly the same as the national statistics. 
a very high risk population with more than one, 76% uh, of men having more than one partner in the last six months. Um, and condom use was universally low, about 69% uh, of patients, of subjects used um, condoms in, uh, on not always used condoms. And that reflects the general numbers around the world. It's about, it's exactly the same. It's about 70% inconsistent condom use around the world. These are the results of the main question, the main outcome, um, the willingness to be circumcised. Are you willing to be circumcised if, if offered free of charge? Before an information session, it was very low. It's about 29% of the men. And after an information session, it went up to 67%, reflecting that since in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti, there is no cultural a role for circumcision if the a strategy is going to bring some benefits, men are more likely to say yes, than in countries where circumcision is a prime uh, uh, tool for identity between tribes and between countries. So when you look at the odds ratio of the willingness to be circumcised by demographic, we found that Haitian men who were interviewed were more likely to say yes to a circumcision procedure than were Dominicans. Education was not related to the outcome and place of residence, rural versus urban, was also not related to the outcome. In the univariate analysis, we found that younger men were more likely to say yes to a circumcision, and there is no difference in men who are single versus the ones who are married or cohabitate. Most people are not married with papers in that area of the country. We found that if men thought that circumcision was going to cause a decrease in pleasure, which is a belief common in the population, they were less likely to submit to the circumcision. And that was statistically significant. We also found, very importantly, that the more men know about the benefits of circumcision, the more, more likely they are to agree to the procedure. So herein, we can see that men who thought that, high, that circumcision was good for hygiene, for the prevention of AIDS, for the prevention of sexually transmitted infections, and for prevention of penile cancer, they were two to three times more likely to agree to the procedure than men who had very little knowledge about the benefits of circumcision. So we knew right in there that education was going to be key to try to introduce this uh, technique to the population. In the multivariate analysis, controlling for all variables, we found that the only predictors of the yes, of the willingness to be circumcised, are where nationality, Haitians being almost two times more likely to say yes to a circumcision in that particular area of the country. Hygiene, meaning men who knew the circumcision or who thought the circumcision was better, or hygiene. And not thinking that circumcision reduces pleasure. So if men thought that circumcision reduced pleasure, they're not agreeing to the procedure. So those are the three variables, the three outcomes, the three variables that are associated with the outcome. Nationality, um, reduction, uh, I mean hygiene, knowing that circumcision reduces, uh, improves hygiene, and not thinking that circumcision decreases pleasure. We also conducted focus group studies with men and women of the province. The, uh, the uh, quantitative analysis was only done in men. Then in focus group studies, we wanted to know the opinion of women, and we found very, very interesting stuff. First, we, we do that men, everybody thinks, most people think that the prime reason for circumcision is when men have problems retracting the foreskin. So it's a medical indication. Nobody viewed it as a preventive strategy. Very few people. The other issue that we learned is that there is a big myth that circumcision reduces sexual pleasure of performance. We knew that hygiene was a prime indicator of willingness. Uh, we learned that there was a lack of knowledge about the uh, benefits of circumcision in terms of HIV prevention. Very few people, including doctors, knew about this. And one thing that uh, was most striking it was that the women's enthusiastic endorsement of male circumcision for their kids and their partners. So when you ask men, what do you think is going to be the greatest barrier to introduce male circumcision to the population, they tell you it's our women. They're never going to let you touch us in that area because it's going to decrease sexual pleasure. When you ask women, what do you think if we circumcise your men, they say, cut them. 
So it was striking to see the lack of similarity between these. So women are enthusiasts of circumcision. And also we learned that we had to use male role models. When you ask men in those focus groups, what would make you undergo a circumcision? They would invariably say, I want to talk to another man who has gone through the procedure and who can tell me, just another man, not you, the doctor, but another man, that they're not having problems with the sexual potency and that they're satisfied with the procedure. So the, we knew that in this, we're gonna have to include male role models. So with that in mind, after the acceptability studies, the second stage is to a pilot introduction of the procedure. And we've um, started this study, it's a pilot study to introduce male circumcision services to prevent HIV infection in two high prevalence areas in Dominican Republic. And herein are the uh, investigators in the Dominican Republic, some of my colleagues are sitting there in the third row. Uh, we partner with the uh, uh, Unidad de Vacunas of the Dermatology Institute and the prime uh, clinic for sexually transmitted infections in Santo Domingo and the Clinica de Familia in La Romana that serves the population of, of uh, sugarcane workers. And our plan this is our team, all of them very smiley there, and some of them are sitting there on the third row, the cut team. <laughs> this is what we plan to do. We plan to do education and training. We're in that stage right now, developing educational materials. We're gonna use in the city of San Domingo a sex worker cohort that is used for vaccine studies to try to attract sex worker clients. And that is clinic A. We plan to recruit 250 men for male circumcision, and we're also gonna recruit patients who come to the clinic for sexually transmitted infections that by definition are high risk for HIV. We're also in clinic B, who serves migrant laborers. We're gonna do an outreach and education in sugar cane fields to bring 250 men, and we're also gonna do an outreach in brothels and bar bars of the area that these men frequent, and trying to recruit a total of 500 men to see if that 67% that we found that would submit to circumcision are really gonna to come to the clinic and have the circumcision. So in summary, because my time is almost up, male circumcision is a prime opportunity to engage men in sexual and reproductive health issues. The acceptability of male circumcision may be high in the Dominican Republic, and I say maybe because this is a study with limitations, it's based on reported data, uh, and it's an analysis on reported behaviors, and it has inherent flaws, but it may be high, especially after provision of information in terms of hygiene, prevention of STIs. We also learned that male role models and women must be an essential component of any male circumcision rollout program in that area of the Caribbean. Uh, no study would be uh, completed without the support of the funders, I want to thank the NIH, the Clinical Translation and Service of the um, University of Illinois, and the Horn Family Foundation, and the men and women of the Alta Gracia province. And lastly, I'll leave you with three uh, magnificent views of three cities. This most gorgeous place where we've been having this meeting, the lovely city of Chicago, one of the places I call home, y la ciudad de Santo Domingo, Primada de América, y situada en ese país, en el mismo trayecto del sol. Muchísimas gracias. Okay, uh, a lot of enthusiasm, please. Questions, comments. <laughs> Excellent presentation. One question. Do you have an idea of the incidence or prevalence of um, cancer of the penis and cancer service, cervix in the cohorts? That's a very interesting question that probably would, would be better answered by some of my colleagues in the audience, but you know, they, I don't know. I don't know the prevalence very much of cancer of the penis. I know that the prevalence of cervical cancer is very high in the Dominican Republic, and Good thing that you bring it up because that's one of the, the what, that's one of the most important benefits of circumcision to women, by decreasing the rates of HPV, which have been proven 
uh, to decrease with circumcision. In the male population, we expect that to indirectly decrease the rates with time of cervical cancer uh, in, in women. So it's one of the, when people ask me, well, what are the benefits for women with this intervention? That's one of them. It is high, I think it's around 20%, 25%, I don't know, of cervical cancer, but 8% 8, 8 of cervical cancer in Dominican Republic, and I don't know the penile cancer. The penile cancer, the, the, what they tell me, it's among the highest rates in the world. So there you um, go. We, we one time were gonna do a project with someone in the United States, and I got over 100 blocks from the Oncological Institute. Oh, well. So it's, it is very high. That's a benefit, um, and also the benefit to women. Two benefits to women. As you, as you decrease the numbers in the male population, you will decrease with time the numbers in women, and you decrease the rates of cervical cancer. Yes. Good day. My name is Achabia Dyer. I'm from the Bahamas. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, considering, um, related to the previous question, considering the other advantages of male circumcision and considering in the adult population, a lot of times you kind of might have already missed the boat by the time you introduce circumcision. Um, is there any advantage to be considered, um, to consider neonatal circumcision as, compared, as opposed to waiting for the adults? Yeah, absolutely. I, it, you know, obviously the objective with all these circumcision programs is to impact the current epidemic, and for that you have to target the sexually active population. In our pilot study, we're, we're, we're targeting men 18 to 35, very sexually active men, where the rates of circumcision are much higher, the rates of HIV are much higher. But in the future, I mean, I think that as circumcision is rolled out in adult men, I think it would make a lot of sense to roll it out in kids because then you won't have the problem 15 years later. Okay, we're taking the final question because we still have a panelist to present. Hi, I'm Vanessa from Haiti. I'm actually very surprised to see your finding about uh, Haitians being more willing to undergo circumcision because that's certainly not the culture in Haiti. And I was curious to know if you had comments from the focus groups to suggest as to why. Yeah. There is, uh, because of the popular, you, you have to interpret that data with caution. And I don't put a lot of credence in that. You know, we're not going after a specific population based on this data. There is inherent to this study, we're working with a migrant population in a country that is different than theirs, and then here comes uh, a white guy asking them a question, so there is desirability bias, and that may be something inherent to this study. They just want to say yes to what you have to say. So I think that may be a component of the whole thing. Another component is, it's maybe that, you know, in that sense, in that area of, the, of that particular population, migrant workers, as opposed to a little bit more educated population in the Dominican Republic. In that area, it might be that they just think they're, they're just, in that sense, they think it's good for them and they would do it. The others are stickers, stickers. Does it uh, provide them access to care? Yeah, Is it, does. it a migrant population it with does. difficulty to? It does, it does provide them access to care, which would be one of the things that, but you could say the same thing about Dominicans. Uh, there is a difference in the educational level of these two population. So it may be that one population, if you tell them, listen, it's going to be good for you, then they will go ahead and do it, as opposed to the other one that could put, um, you know, some thought behind it and try to intellectualize this and not do it. I think that's maybe one of the explanations. I can't rule out desirability bias. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Now we're going to our um, next presenter, Dr. Mo Moises Agosto. is a long-time treatment advocate and educator in the field of HIV. He's the director of the Treatment, Education, Adherence, and Mobilization Division of the National Minority AIDS Council in Washington, D.C., previous to NAC. Mr. Agosto was a program manager of the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition HIV Collaborative Fund and a program of the Thai Center. He was responsible for, pro for program and grant making activities in the Caribbean, Latin America, and Eastern Africa. Before working for ITPC, he was Vice President's Managing Director of Community Assets and a company that publishes healthcare groups 
serves as editor of Sida Ahora magazine and the publication of the People with AIDS Coalition in New York and was an active member of ACT Atop New York. He has served in numerous governments, uh, industry and community advisory boards, and he resides in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Welcome. Gracias. First disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. <clears throat> but I've been working in the area of HIV treatment for um, many, 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 many years as a treatment advocate. So that's the reason why I was asked uh, to do this presentation is to give you a very broad overview or summary of um, issues related to using treatment as prevention, biomedical interventions that would help us and that we have seen in the last couple of months and years uh, new advances in the science that have been very strong and proving that treatment is prevention and that there are a couple of different modalities that we can use to move forward and contain the epidemic, possibly in our lifetime. I mean, I was glad to hear the presentation about circumcision because uh, male circumcision is considered also one of these new biomedical modalities to help us uh, prevent HIV. So. Um, they are also I wanted to, because I was asked to give you a broad summary, there is a more detailed presentation in the afternoon. Dr. Ken Mayer is going to be talking about a, um, treatment as prevention. So I encourage you to go there so you can get more precise information in terms of the clinical data. And some of the slides, I will browse them because of the sake of time. So. Um, one of the things that I like to start talking about very about the importance of this time that we are living now and in which we have these tools is that it's a game changer and is that something that has showed you how science has advanced and, and I like always to mention a couple of the things that through the years we have seen science has helped us to you know, see the way we're going to treat HIV and also how, what are the things that we can do to keep the patients living longer. Uh, for example, uh, ones that I will highlight like prophylaxis for opportunistic infections, that was something really important when we, you know, realized that we could prevent PCP, that we could prevent MAC infection, that we could prevent fungal infections with, med with medications. Also, <clears throat> One other landmark uh, that was a game changer in the way we work with HIV was, you know, the discovery of the introduction of combination therapy when we discovered new classes of HIV drugs beside uh, nucleoside analogs and we started to uh, realize through our studies that you could treat successfully patients with the combination of antiretroviral therapies. Also the introduction of different type of diagnostic tools, and now recently with the introduction of biomedical clinical modalities um, that I will briefly talk to you during this time. Um, one of the first, the first very significant landmarks that we have seen through, that has been very successful in preventing HIV infection, you know, we saw it through the implementation of the ACTG 076, ACTG stands for AIDS Clinical Trials Group, is a network of research from the NIH. And in this, in this study um, was to look at the mother-to-child transmission. You all know, are aware of that and how effective this intervention is. I wanted to mention also the CAPRISA study, the 004 study, because of the importance of looking at a study that talk about using treatment as prevention, but not in the context of motherhood, but in the context of a woman's sexuality. And the CAPRISA study was a study that was looking at the effectiveness and safety of my, my vaginal microbicide using tenofovir, which is one of the drugs that also has been used, and I will tell you later, uh, for prevention in HIV negative uh, men. Um, and, but this was for HIV, uh, for women that were HIV negative to, through the use of the microbicide, try to prevent infection or being exposed uh, to the virus. Then we know needle exchange, many studies have been shown that needle exchange and clean needles works in the context of preventing HIV and uh, male circumcision as we just heard. And also, 
I wanted to mention uh, a cohort study that was done by Dr. Julio Montaner in British Columbia that introduced us to the concept of viral law. And this was a very smart concept that Dr. Montaner introduced to us to let us see how important was going to is if we get to what, what will happen if we manage to scale up the drugs, the use of HIV medication in a population that have the proper infrastructure to get services. And what we saw was that he went back to, you know, uh, records that he had from uh, patients through the years, and in his finding, he saw that when, when he was increasing through the years the use of antiretrovirals in patients, when you look at the chart, you see that as increase, you see a decline in the curve of infections that occur, and also you see a decline on morbidity. You know, and that kind of sparked the idea that if we, you know, if we start studying and seeing that we increase the use of antiretrovirals, we not only will benefit those that are HIV infected, but we will also benefit those that are not. So, um, as I mentioned, um, in terms of, of this, um, when Julio Montaner presented this concept, um, other studies were going, were going on. I'm sure you have heard about studies that have been uh, presented which tell us that the levels of undetectability in viral low could be related to levels of undetectability in seminal fluids. Also, with the a HIV Prevention Trials Network, that's another network of the NIH, with the study O52, also, we have seen that they use, with this study, the use of antiretroviral and serodiscordant couples using kind of the, it's, it's the study, and I will talk to you a little bit more about it uh, later, uh, the premise from Dr. Montaner, but also the premise of if we start earlier or later, what would happen. Um, also, other approach in terms of biomedical research that we have with the pre-exposure prophylaxis um, I'm going to browse through this um, uh, pre-exposure prevention to women. Pre-exposure prophylaxis has to do, um, we started to see that and we started to see the post-exposure prophylaxis in the healthcare workers community, the use of antiretrovirals. At that time, um, we saw in 1997 a reduction using ACT of 81%, and then there's guidelines now that you can use more than one or two, three drugs. In terms of all 52, 52, I'm sorry, I think that the importance of this study is that you, know, you have 1,763 discordant couples. And then from these couples, you know, their average of CD4 cells was 350 to 550. And um, you have the partners being randomized to start treatment immediately or being deferred to start treatment when they were under 250 CD4. Um, at, at one moment while this study was going on, they, the Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the study and um, the most meaningful result, and you will hear the details of it later in the session this afternoon, is that we were able to see a 96 reduction in transmission from, from the people that were in the study that were positive, those that decided to start treatment earlier. Um, you can see in the numbers in the corner that we, you saw 28 cases of people in the group of people that were divided in two that started later, less than 250, but in the group of people that started with, you know, as soon as they knew more than 250 CD4s, they saw one case of infection. So that's 96% reduction of transmission is a very significant number. So. Um, I'm not going to go through this. These are definitions that you, must, that you should know. This is Caprisa that I already mentioned. I wanted to, you know, in terms of the criteria that the NIH has been put in place, if we're going to talk about treatment as prevention in HIV negative people, we need to make sure about these guidelines, safe drugs that penetrate the tissue, that protect against HIV infection in the tissue, have long-lasting activity, and also that it doesn't have significant drug interaction, is affordable and very easy to implement. Um, then other, other approaches in terms of pre-exposed -ex, pre prophylaxis are targeted to communities of HIV pe people that are HIV negative. So there have been two drugs that have been considered uh, for this that have shown some success in some communities and have, you know, 
generate more question in other communities, and it's in the approach of PrEP. Uh, the drugs that have been used have been tenofovir by itself, or in combination with M3, M3, M3 cetabine plus tenofovir, which is the one that we all know as Truvada. There are concerns about this approach, concerns that have to do with you know, these are drugs, for example, that have been used widely as first-line therapy. So we, there, there are some questions about resistance because these drugs have been already used in people HIV positive, and also their toxicity is related to what uh, Dr. Tebas mentioned, the bone density uh, concerns, also renal concerns when people use tenofovir, and most importantly in the context of our communities, the cost of these medications. Um, I'm just not going to go to the details. There are clinical trials that have gone on or using tenofovir <clears throat> as PrEP. Um, also, there have been a study that was done in the gay community that was using, you know, using um, tenofovir and Truvada and placebo as well. <clears throat> and this study has had a lot of attention, have gotten a lot of attention because it did show a 44% reduction in viral in transmission of HIV and people being infected. Um, when they, they did it in different parts of the, con the, the globe, South America, South Africa, Thailand, and you know, they were able to see in the group of placebo, 64 infection in the group of people that were taking tenofovir, they saw the 36, in 36 infections. There were some details about that. Some of the people that got infected, they were in the, in the process of acute infection, which means that they were not, they, were, they still were exposed, but, but they were not infected at the moment of the enrollment, and that was an issue. But when they did a study, a sub-study in the United States with the group from the United States, they saw that the levels of drug that were able to be measured in that subgroup were very high, and it took us to a reduction of 92% in the risk of infection. So that is important because that tells us that probably in the other groups that we study in other countries, infrastructure is a very important issue, infrastructure in terms of community access, uh, access for the community to do community services, education, et cetera. So adherence is key for us to be successful in any of these approaches. So um, the CDC put out some guidelines that you can go and see in the website. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just skip it. Also, there were studies done in women, in the population of women. This study, in speci specifically the Data Safety Monitoring Board had to stop it. Um, and I think was one of the arms because they didn't see a, a significant benefit, which bring more questions about why in one group is, is, is we see a reduction and one in another group we don't see it. So, but there is, you know, there, we need to be able to figure this out. There was some guidance that, but some statement that have been uh, uh, developed by the CDC in which they tell us to be very cautious. And the reason I, because it has been successful in gay men, doctors are already, some doctors are prescribing using Truvada to some patients um, that are HIV negative but are sexually active. So the CDC have put together some guidelines for gay men and also for women um, in this case. So also there have been studies uh, done in partners, in couples that also have shown some um, significant or good level of uh, protective efficacy uh, this study was the partner's prep. You can look, uh, Google it if you want more details. I'll come this afternoon to the session. Also, uh, there was uh, no different in this study. We raised a the question. There was no different in the use of just tenofovir and Truvada. And there was no different in side effects or lab abnormalities. But we saw a protective efficacy, 62% in the, in the group that were using tenofovir and 73% in the group that was using Truvada. So we see some efficacy, we don't see a big difference among them, but this tell us and give us information to continue looking for this. So what do we know now? We know that taking antiretrovirals help us with reducing transmission. We also know that in, in the HIV negative community, we used uh, treatment, we use the concept of PrEP, we may be able to reduce the transmission of HIV infection on people that are uh, sexually active, very sexually active. Also, we we have um, the use of male circumcision. Um, so now that we have this ability also, I think the O52 study is very important. It will be the win-win 
that um, we were expecting for. So operationaliz operationalization and implementation, one of the things that I wanted you to go home with is that even though the science is very strong about this and we could be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of that we can contain the epidemic with the use of treatment as a tool for prevention, we need to make sure that it's used in the context of the, mod the tools that we already have been using. This doesn't mean that people are gonna stop using condom or stop you know, using other modalities. People will still be using condoms, hopefully, but that we people will have another option that is clinical and biomedical. So this, this was a slide I wanted to show you very quickly. When we talk about science, great, you know, perfect, it's proven, but when we go to the real world and we go to the side of public health and how we're gonna implement it and do this and make it work, it's a whole different story. So this was a paper that uh, Dr. Gardner uh, wrote about you know, how we're going to look at this in the, with the public health vision and my, uh, mind frame. And I just wanted to show you that we have in the United States one million um, cases, for example, of people that are infected. Then you see the other bar of people that are diagnosed, you, that we know. And then you see those that have been linked to care, 600. And then we see those that have been retained to care, 400. And then you see those that need antiretroviral therapy but know their status. You know, and then we see the number of those that are on antiretroviral therapy, and then we see the number of those that have been able to be adherent to their medication that is so necessary for this to be successful. So you see, this shows you the big challenge that we have in front of us to make sure that the science works when we move it to the real world. Um, in terms of um, the HIV biomedical treatment is prevention. What do we do? What, how do we do it? Um, one of the things that I just quickly wanted to touch base that I think is important is that we need to stretch community mobilization because this is something that we cannot do treatment and prevention separate anymore as well as testing. So we need to mobilize the community because it needs to come from the leadership we develop. Uh, it has to be the intervention I strongly feel and other studies has been done and demonstration projects in which the community evidence-based approaches are the ones that are gonna make us move forward and that we need to look at universal access, that people with AIDS should be very involved from the very beginning in the implementation of this kind of pro 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 projects, that we need to look at stigma as one of the biggest obstacles that we have. Um, also, we need to look at the political and, 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 and public policy and guidance that at all government levels. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, people, if we're gonna start talking about using antiretroviral for prevention in a world that is lacking of access of antiretroviral for people that are already sick. I mean, we have ethical and policy issues that we need to look in place, plus the economic factors that we need to look at. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna just jump to the conclusions. Very simple, we have a strong scientific data, evidence-based that proved that AIDS, the AIDS epidemic could be contained we need to remove and work together all the social, economic, and political obstacles and make it a reality, make that next generation to be AIDS-free. So uh, please go to the session this afternoon because you'll be able to, in detail, get the whole scope of what does this mean and what do we need to do. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Uh, Leslie and Dupont, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I have two questions. Basically, it's about the microbicide caprisa. One is how available is it on the market, especially in the Caribbean? And two, can you give me a little more information as to its effectiveness where men are concerned? Second part was? Can you give me a little bit more information as to its effectiveness where men are concerned? Oh, well, there have been studies that are looking at the use of microbicide in men. Um, uh, I don't know, I'm not very familiar where they are, but I know they have been developing and implementing studies for uh, rectal use of microbicide, if that's the question you're asking. Okay. Um, in terms of the Caribbean and the Caprices study, 
Um, I, don't, I don't have that much of the details, so probably in the afternoon, um, in the session, when they go to the detail with the story, you, they could answer. Please uh, remember to return the evaluation form. There will be somebody in the at the door collecting it. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody.